Velkommen alle sammen. Hamingja, the Old Norse word for luck, or even some people equating it to the Hindu karma. Hamingja can also be kind of a guardian spirit. Without a doubt, Hamingja is one of those concepts that is spoken about most in the community of the Norse uh, spirituality. Unfortunately, it's the subject, probably the number one subject that the most people talk out of their ass about, just making things up with very little, if any, knowledge about the actual sources of this word. Don't get mad at them, because, you know, even I did this for many years, and it's because the sources are actually so vague and conflicting about what Hamingya is but also the fact that it has been translated very poorly into most of the English versions of the texts and sagas that you have probably all read. Have no fear though, in this video I'm going over those sources, I'll show you a couple of them in their original Old Norse, and kind of tie them all together so you can all form your own beliefs about what this Norse version of karma really is. Okay, so the main thing you are going to see about Hamingya is that it can just mean something like luck or good fortune. Uh, even in the modern Icelandic it means something like good luck or happiness. And there are also uh, other Old Norse words with a similar meaning such as Eudna, Gifta and Gefa. They all mean something like good luck or good fortune. Hamingya is a bit different though, because in some sources, the Hamingya can actually be a spiritual being, a very real female protective spirit that kind of guards humans and grants them good fortune throughout their lives. Just like the Fylgja, which there is a huge connection with by the way, but first let's look at the translation. We think the word Hamingya comes from uh, the Old Norse Hamer and Genya or Ganga. Hamid meaning shape, skin, outer form, and a part of our souls, and Ganga meaning to walk or to step. So the Hamingya is the Hamid that walks, or the walk of the Hamid, uh, or something like that. Um, guys, I really don't like this etymology and this translation. I just find it hard to see the connection for uh, as to what it really is, and I think the translation, when we look at it like that, kind of sends us in the wrong direction. However, I don't have any better suggestions about this etymology of the word, so I will accept this etymology for now. Fair enough, um, at least until someone comes up with a better uh, interpretation. Um, that's all we can do, as hopefully, as we are human beings with a functioning brain. If you disagree with something, you have to basically come up with a more logical or better theory in response to something you don't disagree. We can't just go around being an asshole, saying that others are wrong, with absolutely nothing intelligent to give an input in return. So many of us can learn from that. Uh, so sure, uh, I'll accept that for now, that this is the proper uh, interpretation of the word Hamingya. Um, but um, yeah, let us know in the comments if uh, you guys have any better ideas as to what that could be. But now, on to the sources. As you would expect, uh, Hamingya is attested way more as just meaning simply good luck or good fortune um, in the real historical accounts, but when we get into the ones with kind of uh, mythological um, or legendary sagas, um, which there are actually very few of, it tends to be a real spiritual and even a physical being, the Hamingya. But let's get into the real historical accounts first. Uh, the first one is Alexander Saga. It is an Old Norse translation of the famous story of Alexander the Great. Um, it makes more frequent use of the word Hamingya in here than any other text in Old Norse sources, um, at least relative to the total size of the text. Um, that is due to the original Latin poem where the word fortuna is very common. Uh, sometimes it just means good fortune, but sometimes um, it is a very clear personification of the Roman goddess fortuna, and it is listed in this Old Norse source too as being among uh, the Norse goddesses, the Gidhjur. Uh, another example of the Hamingya being personified as a real spiritual female being in here, uh, two men in there call themselves the messengers of the Hamingya, and 
one of them is uh, talking about their adversaries, Hamingya, uh, in this part of the text. So this is one of the only sagas where the Hamingya is actually attested as a real spiritual being. Um, but remember, this one is from, uh, it's an ancient uh, Roman poem, actually, um, uh, but the vast majority of the other Norse sources, it simply means good luck. An example here in the Sigurdai saga, there are multiple mentions of Uhamingya with no touch of personification at all. It simply means bad luck in this source, and that's listed uh, quite a few times. Another in the Veralda Saga, Uhamingya is mentioned again as just meaning bad luck or bad fortune. It is said that King Solomon, in his old age, he was stricken by great Uhamingya as he fell in love with many heathen women, it was said about him. In Inglinga Saga, uh, this is probably the most famous Norse saga that a lot of you have read. Hamingya does come up once where Odin, uh, with his knowledge uh, in magic, he is said to be able to bring death or uhamingya or sickness and also um, uh, taking from men he curses uh, their uh, sense or strength and giving it to others. Uh, so that's a very famous one and I'll uh, come back to that too. In Egil Saga, my second favorite saga of the whole Viking Age, we have two mentions of Halminya in here. The old Kredulf reminds his son Turulf that he had warned him already that if he visited to the king, it would not bring any uh, good Halminya to the family. Later on, when Turulf, the son, ended up being killed by King Harald, Kvelulf doubts um, whether he himself will be granted the Hamingya of revenge. So here it kind of denotes that like uh, he wanted revenge, but he doesn't know if he would attain the good enough fortune to be able to um, uh, deal out that revenge to King uh, Harald. So all of these have basically no personification. The ones that I went over can clearly be explained as meaning just good or bad luck. But we will get into a couple more interesting sources here. In Vattensdala Saga, Hamingya has a little bit of personification. A father addresses his son with the words um, uh, that has now come to try his strength and now Fath Hamingyan vil unafed. It's basically like what fortune is willing to allow you. Almost like Hamingya in here is kind of a conscious thing that may grant him some strength to, to do whatever he is going to do. Another more interesting mention of Hamingya in Vatnsdala Saga a newborn boy. Uh, was named Ingimundur. He was named after his maternal grandfather who had just died in hopes that the grandfather um, would pass on his Hamingya to the young newborn Ingimundur and it would be inherited. So in this source, it's definitely denoting that the meaning it, it, it is a meaning of good luck or good fortune, but it does seem like something very tangible that can be passed on. Uh, I just want to bring up a connection there to the poetic Edda poems called the Helgileis. Basically, the newborn sons in a lineage in the in the dynasty, and the, uh, they keep inheriting the name Helgi, and they also inherit this Valkyrie or the Filia to protect them in life. Most of you guys have read those uh, poems, the Helgileis or Völsunga Saga. Long story, I won't go into that because Hamingya is not actually mentioned in there. I'm just pointing out the connection and the similarities. Now we get on to my absolute favorite source, and that, that is the one that really helped me form my beliefs about Hamingya. And that is in Olav Saga Trygva Sonar where our beloved Håkon the Jarl, after he dies, he was said to have many qualifications for being a great leader, and he had great ancestry, and he had wisdom and prudence, and he had the great ability to manage the ruling power, and he also had fearlessness in battle, it says, and by that the fortune of good Hamingya coming off as victorious in killing his enemies. So these are the types of things that may grant you very strong Hamingya, like you can see here. Now, this is contrasted in this very next chapter, saying that Jarl Håkon was a very generous man, 
but such a great chieftain as he was, he had an extreme uhamanya, like misfortune, on his death day. Of course, that's referring to the death of uh, Yard Holkun when he was killed by his slave and left in a pig pen to die. So what the hell is this all about? The great Yard Holkun, all of our hero. He had the strongest of Hamingyas and he did all the right deeds to make sure his fortune was as good as possible. And in the end, he ends up with the worst Uhamingya, and he ends up dying in a pile of pig shit. So how does that all work? Well, Yard Hokon was a great man, and a kind man, too, in every sense of the word, and a great leader, and generous, and all these positive things that would, you know, bring you good Hamingya, or good karma, if you want to use that word. But Yard Hokon was a fuckboy. <laughs> <laughs> he was known to trick all the most beautiful women in Norway to say he wanted to marry them. Oh yeah, come here, baby, let's get married, come on. So he'd bring them in, and he would just bang them for a few days and then send them back home to their fathers, okay? Uh, this was actually his downfall and made him the most loved man in Norway to the most hated. I believe that Hamingya can be gained just similar to the Hindu version of karma, just by being a kind, honorable, generous person. But the Norse, um, there's a lot more connection to bravery in there. Bravery grants you good um, hamanya and good fortune, and also being a good leader and all that. But treatment of women also plays a very big factor here, especially when it comes to this spiritual protection that the filia is responsible for. Have you guys ever noticed, have you seen someone in life who is just a complete ass, mean, horrible person, but they have all the luck, they have such good luck. He may not deserve it, but maybe he's brave, or he's a good leader, or he's he does some good things, so his hamanya may actually be strong and grant him good luck. Have you guys ever met a very nice person sometimes, but they just have really bad luck in life. Life keeps giving them um, uh, crappy hands. Um, no, they maybe don't deserve that, but it may be because they are maybe don't have some of these other qualities. Maybe they are not brave, maybe they are not generous, but other than that, they are a nice person. I'll admit... I've always been a good person, I would like to think, in my life, but I definitely was not very generous, and I was um, a little bit of a coward when I was younger, and I believe this was a reason that I faced a lot of bad luck in my younger years. I'll give you what I'm really getting at here, though. Have you guys ever seen someone who has great luck? They, they have everything going for them. They are brave and kind and honorable, but they're hurt all the time. These men who are like this, they're hurt or injured all the time, they tend to be very unkind to women for whatever reason, whatever that may be. Uh, I promise I see this every time, I see this everywhere I look. Every guy I've ever met who is unkind to women, whether he's disrespectful or he uses them or whatever, he may be very lucky and very successful and very, you know, lots of good things going for him in life. But he's always injured. He's like a feeble, like broken bones all the time. Or he's always sick. Or he's always getting hurt in the gym or whatever. Uh, coming from me, a fighter, I can see this. I pay attention to these things. And I promise, I promise it's true. Just take a look and let me know what you guys think. Do you notice these uh, things in life? Remember... If we are to believe these things, uh, the Filia in the North world is a female spirit that basically follows you everywhere you go and is responsible for protecting you from injury, illness, death. And if you piss off that female spirit, she is not going to want to do her job to protect you. So it's a lesson to never abuse your power and success and good hamanya to take advantage of women. Perfect example you can see here in Yard Hawkins case, and I think there's plenty of evidence that this was a common belief among the Norse because forever, eh, since the dawn of time, as far back as we have records, women in Scandinavia are actually treated better than pretty much everywhere else in the world. So that could be a big part of this uh, hamingya that is ingrained in our uh, heads. Next source that will also give us something very important. 
Saint Olaf saga, there is Hamingya mentioned many times in here. It's definitely listed as an unpersonified, just good luck or bad luck several times. Uh, one time, a man blames another man for having rushed into such a big Uhamingya and brought himself down um, uh, uh, the king's anger uh, and wrath unnecessarily. Another example is the King Olaf. His Hamingya is said to have turned out to be stronger than the sorcery of the Finns who he was going up against in a battle and he came away with the victory. Another time in here, one of the petty kings um, mentioned that he warned his colleagues not to etia hamenu vid Olav Haraldsson, basically saying um, he does not trust his own luck to match uh, King Olav's, basically comparing his own hamenya to King Olav's hamenya. On another occasion, King Olav hesitates to trust his Hamingya so unconditionally as to meet his enemies with only a small force. So Hamingya could mean like success in battle, but I don't trust my Hamingya that much to go meet them when we're a much smaller force. Um, then another cool thing that's mentioned in this saga, uh, here it appears as though an individual's Hamingya can be given away to others. There is a man named Yalti, he is taking off on a dangerous voyage and asks for King Hadald to give him some of his Hamingya for the journey. And when he does this, again here, it's a crappy translation, they, they translate it to you like, give me your blessing, but it's clearly not the same. It's listed as Hamingya here in the Old Norse version as you can see. So both guys here, Hjalti and Olav, have a bit of Hamingya and good luck, but the king is of course thought to have more Hamingya, so Hjalti asks if he can borrow it. Very cool source there, and that can help us learn a lot. Last one is in the Viga Glums saga. This is the most important one out of all the sagas. Because it's the only very real, crystal clear mention of a real spiritual being as being the Hamingya. A man's Hamingya, uh, Glum, appears in a dream uh, to his nephew in the shape of a gigantic armored woman. And Glum had died, and it was actually his nephew who was inheriting this Hamingya, this maiden, this giant maiden in this source. And here it very much, very clearly was a very real spiritual being responsible for looking after him um, and inherited um, through lineage, just like a Fylgja or a Valkyrie might be. So that's it for the sagas, but now we really get into the most we can maybe call it the most important source, and that's in the Poetic Edda, uh, which are basically the only sources that were not not written by Christian authors, and we can be very sure that they were written by pagans uh, with a pagan full understanding of them. In Vafthrudnismal, which is basically a conversation between Odin and Vafthrudnir, the giant, and here it speaks of the plural uh, Hamenyud, as actual maidens, actual spiritual beings here. So the translations that you are going to find on these guys are pretty much all dog shit <laughs> that you will find in any English translations today, but here is the Old Norse original right next to it, basically saying that these maidens called the Hamingyud um, protect all children of men that dwell on earth, even though that these Hamingyud are actually part of the giant race, the Jultuns, um, which are the ones that typically try to harm human and earth. So there you have it. Um, the wisest giant of them all, Vafthrudnir, tells you exactly what the Hamingya are, although it's pretty cryptic and we can't really know much uh, more than that. That's it, guys. Um, you would expect Hamingya to come up a lot more in the uh, mythological texts like the Poetic Edda or the Prose Edda, but it's just not. Uh, I may have missed a couple. But I even looked back in the Old Norse translations of these in the Poetic and Prose Edda. I even did a page search on the computer, Control F, and I did not find any other mentions of it other than in Vafthrudnismal. I could be wrong though, let me know if I missed any, but that's about it. I went over all the meaningful attestations of Hamingya in this video. Let me know if you guys found any others. So we know a few things then basically from these sources I went over. First, Hamingya could just mean good luck or good fortune, of course. It can definitely, definitely be passed on to descendants and even, maybe even given away temporarily to aid others. 
number four. Um, someone could also give you Uhamingya, just like um, Odin did to his enemies in Inglinga Saga. You could curse someone with Uhamingya. Number five, people who have great Hamingya are typically the ones that are great leaders, they have great ancestry, they have wisdom and a good ruling power and fearlessness in battle, just like Håkon the Jarl did. So those are some ways that we know we can uh, build and develop our Hamingya. But seven, it can also just mean bad luck. You could have Uhamingya under certain circumstances that we're not quite sure about. All of them, certain actions and and traits could give you um, uh, Uhamingya, bad luck. So like such things such as cowardice, unkindness, and bad treatment of women are a few, but there are probably lots more that we don't know of from the sources. So that's at least what we know from the sources. But like I said, there is a huge connection to the Filia and the Valkyries. Um, there are no sources. I know a lot of people like to say the Filia and the Hamingya are the same thing. There are no sources um, even suggesting that at all. Of course, there. Of course, it is. They are very connected. They are similar, and there is plenty of evidence that they are connected. But that is a long subject for another video. Exactly how connected they are, and if they are one and the same thing. Um, there, but there's no clear sources at least. Um, That'll be a long video. I'll have to do one on the Filgia, and that will take a long time. I haven't done it yet, but I have done one on the Valkyries that you can check out in the meantime. But that's about all the sources we have on Hamingya, all the meaningful ones at least. Uh, there are uh, more things we can look at. We can look at parallel concepts of the Hamingya in different cultures around the world. We can look at even experiences of people and the Hamingya, even, even my own personal experiences, but this is just not the type of stuff that I wish to uh, speak about out in the open on YouTube, but Patreon supporters get this full insight into my wildest parts of my mind, and I'll do a video on that. Um, uh, privately on the Patreon here in the next couple days. But uh, that's about it for today. Hope you enjoyed and that at least gives you some ideas and, and directions to go as to how you want to form your beliefs on the Hamingya, but at least you have the sources to do so. But that's all for today. Vi ses nästa gång.